This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 118, recorded January 27th, 2011. Hi, everyone. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and it's time for TWIV, the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from a snowed-in western Massachusetts is Alan Dove. Good to be here. Well, good to be on TWIV anyway. I think you came from something warm to this, right? Yes. I. Um, so this week I'm I'm home in Massachusetts. Last week uh, we went on vacation to Puerto Rico. Wow. Hey. And I have to say I preferred that to this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you yeah. came highs, home to more highs snow. in the mid 80s. You know, in the summertime I get tired of highs in the mid 80s, but uh, middle of January and and we were actually out of town for um, for a major winter storm. You're lucky. Well, we've had a couple. Uh, we had one today. We got 18 inches here. And um, we had one a couple of days ago. It seems like every few days we have a, a foot of snow. Interesting. Yeah, the one winter. the one we got last last week left a nice collection of icicles along the eaves, and then mm. uh, we got another uh, almost a foot um, last night. So, well, welcome back. Thank you. And our other guest has no snow because he's in North Central Florida. Rich Condit. Hi, fellas. <laughs> it's not a guest. <laughs> I called you a I called you a guest, but you're a host. That's cool. We're all hosts. You know, We're all hosts. Yeah. We're actually hosts for viruses. Yeah, I'm Indeed. not seeing much. I'm not seeing much snow out my window. It's looking pretty good. It's a little chilly, 58 degrees. You but know? from time to time, it does snow there, right? Uh, it snowed 20 years ago. I, I thought it snowed over the holidays this year. They, they uh, a couple of my friends reported snowflakes um, uh, over the holidays. Yes, I didn't see them. I was here. I didn't see them, but apparently, that happened. But those were those were just falling out of a private plane that was on its way from Miami. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, they were going to uh, a lab to be experimented with with mice immunized with uh, adenoviruses, right? Yeah. Well, today's episode. Well, before we do that, uh, Alan, we had a great episode last week with Seth Manukin. Ah, uh, yes. Right. I haven't had a chance to listen to it yet, but I'm. It's definitely in yeah, the queue. He was really good. He, yeah. Uh, very good. We got really deep into stuff, and a few comments on the what TV were, were appreciative that we could spend that much time talking to him because you know mainstream, he'll get ten minutes, right? Right, exactly. But we can do an hour and a half, so that was yeah. Really we got good. into some fun stuff. That was good. It was fun, interesting stuff. Yeah, sorry I missed that. Although you know, given given the option, I I am still glad that I was. I fully yeah, you understand. Didn't, you, didn't want to, you didn't want to cancel your trip to Puerto Rico. <laughs> no, no, it wasn't. Qu- I'm sure it's not quite that good a show. <laughs> I think it would have been interesting uh, to have you on from yeah. your perspective, but oh, we'll I would have loved back. It. another we'll have... time. We'll have him back. All right, today's episode all email. Well, God, we have so many great questions, so let's get right down to it. And I think, Rich, you should do the first one from Jenny. Okay, uh, Jenny writes, "Hi, Twivers. I'm currently listening to episode 84, Gators Go Viral, and I'm so excited to hear you talk about my virus, EHV-1, even if it was only briefly, and I decided it was finally time to write you guys a letter. I am a PhD student in Melbourne, Australia. I found TWIV when I attended ASV in Bozeman. In a strange coincidence, I am actually wearing the T-shirt from the meeting and have been busily trying to catch up on past episodes. I actually uh, met Vincent and was fortunate enough to sit with him and Carla Kierkegaard at dinner following the live TWIV session. I love the addition of Rich to the group because he always asks or makes the comments that I would ask if I were part of the conversation. Sometimes I even talk to the radio when I'm listening in the car. So do I. Oh, yeah. Uh, I I talk to the radio even when it's not on sometimes. (laughs) I've recently been collecting samples about two hours out of Melbourne almost every day, and that has really helped me catch up. So I have a question and a suggestion. The question is about vaccinia. From what I understand, which may be wrong, vaccinia is the virus that causes cowpox or is very closely related to it. Is it still around in the environment, and does it still cause disease in cows? If so, can people become naturally infected with vaccinia? Um, let's uh, deal with that first. 
Okay, great question. I love this question. Uh, and in fact, there are Pox specific episodes that uh, address uh, both aspects of this question. Uh, episode 26 was uh, my first uh, first time I turned up on this show, and it's all about pox viruses, and it addresses the origins of vaccinia. And in episode 95, we talk about the reemergence of vaccinia in Brazil. So the deal is that Jenner in 1796 isolated virus from the hand of a milkmaid who got it from a cow. And so that clinically would have been cowpox. And that virus he used to um, inoculate a young boy and subsequently proved by trying to basically challenge him with smallpox later on, a standard technique at the time called variolation, that he had immunized the kid against smallpox. Uh, so then that virus, and probably uh, in the course of history, there were several re-isolates several times, several people. So there's all sorts of strains of vaccinia all over the place. But something perhaps originating from that original isolation, perhaps subsequent isolations, uh, for 200 years has been used as the smallpox vaccine. And then emerge modern techniques for analyzing this stuff and finding out what it is. And it turns out that the stuff we call vaccinia, which has been used as a vaccine for smallpox, is genetically significantly distinct from the disease that is currently circulating in cattle that we call cowpox. Uh, and up until a few years ago, uh, one could not find vaccinia virus in the wild. Uh, it was just something that we used as a vaccine strain. So how vaccinia got here is a mystery. So it could be that it uh, evolved in investigators or in clinicians' hands over the 200 years from when it was originally isolated as cowpox, uh, or it could be that it was not the same as what we now call cowpox. Either maybe cowpox now is different than it was 200 years ago. Or uh, the disease that calls cowpox 200 years ago or whatever gender isolated has since become extinct. So we don't have an explanation for this. Can you do phylogenetic analysis and say vaccinia came from cowpox? Do a bunch of sequences? Well, all the pox viruses are uh, related. I've got it. Matter of fact, I got a tree here somewhere. Um, but you don't that's... know what's at the root of the tree. Uh, no, not really. You know, some ancient pox virus. Let's see here. But it, the question is: Is cowpox ancestral to vaccinia on that tree? Um, I'm I'm looking, looking because I got the tree right here. Make sure you water it. Right. Thanks. I got to find cowpox. Oh, there's cowpox, Brighton. The way this particular tree is written, that's hard to tell. Okay. I can't really tell. But I guess it's uh, not, it hasn't resolved the issue because we don't no, know where no. vaccinia came from. Yeah. Right. And certainly I haven't heard people, I haven't heard people say, oh, well, uh, vaccinia is obviously a derivative of cowpox and evolved yeah. from it. Okay. Yeah. So if that were a, a prevalent theory, I think I'd know about it. At any rate, people don't know where vaccinia came from. Now, in the last... I guess it's 10 years, about 10 years ago, uh, a strain of uh, virus that was clinically behaving like cowpox was isolated in Brazil. And when I say clinically behaving like cowpox, what that means is that uh, it shows up on the udders of cows and is picked up by uh, farm workers who uh, milk the cows and they get lesions on their hands. So clinically it behaves like cowpox. Uh, and that thing was characterized, and it looks like vaccinia virus. Not only does it look like vaccinia virus, but it has a signature deletion that um, is identical to a unique uh, deletion that is present in the strain of vaccinia that was used to uh, vaccinate people in Brazil for smallpox. Uh, Brazil had its own smallpox vaccination strain. So the supposition there is that during the smallpox eradication campaign in Brazil, 
uh, vaccine vaccine virus became established in the wild and probably we didn't know much about it because everybody was vaccinated so it never showed up but now that nobody's being vaccinated anymore there is a reemergence of cowpox like disease in brazil that apparently represents spread of vaccinia virus and there have been a couple of other isolates of uh vaccinia uh virus like agents i think and a disease called buffalo pox in India, though that's not all vaccinia virus. So it appears that on more than one occasion, uh, vaccinia virus that was probably used as uh, the vaccine strain has become reestablished in the wild. Hmm. So there you go. Interesting story. On with the letter. My suggestion is for you to get someone to talk about EHV-1. Um, uh, dudes, I'm blanking on EHV-1. Equine herpes virus. Ah, right. Okay. Uh, my suggestion is you get someone uh, in to talk about EHV-1 because it is really a really interesting virus and very important veterinary path pathogen. I might be biased, she says. It can cause, apart from re the respiratory disease and abortions you mentioned on episode 84, a serious uh, myelo myeloencephalitis. myeloencephalitis that was classified as potent a potentially emerging disease by the USDA in 2007. One of the main focuses of my research is why we see much lower levels of this form of disease in the Australia in Australia's as uh, as well as trying to understand the pathogenesis. A paper that's had a big impact on research into the virus is uh, Nugent et al. She gives a, a reference. Would be a good place to start if you're interested. Love the podcast, and I'm dreading catching up because then I will have to wait a week between episodes. I recommend it to anyone who will listen, but I don't think I've converted many people yet. Most people think I'm a bit strange for thinking viruses are fascinating. Sorry if this doesn't make any sense, because I've been in the lab since 5 a.m. Keep up the great work, and I'll keep listening and telling people. Jenny. Great. Yeah, we ought to do something about sure. EHV. Well, for, let's yeah. find someone who uh, knows about it, and we'll do it. Sure. Uh, actually, I know somebody. Uh, yeah. I'm blanking on the name right now, but I'll think of it. Okay. I'll put it on the list of uh, show requests. Yeah, it sounds like a cool virus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Jenny, from Australia. Uh, the next one is from Connor uh, Allen. Sure. Um, so Connor writes, hi, Twivers or Twivists. I like that. Twivists. Yeah, Twivists. That's cool. interesting. Um, as everyone says, I love the show. It gives me a great view of virology outside of my work in HIV. I just wanted to send on two papers from the HIV field, which may help in answering the question posted by Pratesh in TWIV 107, that was our previous all-email episode, uh, about the distribution of glycoproteins on the surface of virions. And uh, he sends a couple of links. Um, and continues, uh, it has been shown in the, the interaction between HIV and CCR5, that's one of the HIV receptors, that multiple chemokine receptors are required for successful viral entry. Also, as multiple glycoprotein trimers are involved in the receptor interactions, the majority of the viri virion surface trimers are present at the site of interaction with the host cell. These results indicate that the distribution of glycoproteins is not only heterogeneous across the virion surface, but plays a major role in the binding of host receptors during cell entry. I hope these papers shed some light on the topic. Thanks again for all the great weekly info. And uh, he's in transit between uh, N NUI Galway in Ireland and Dalhousie University in Halifax, Canada. I um, guess he was on the plane when he wrote this email. guess he's there already. Okay. We've had this email for a while. Oh, uh, yeah. We, we, uh, we have by, the, by the way, if you don't hear your email read on TWIV immediately, it's because we're very backlogged. Yeah, we'll get to it. Uh, thank you, Connor. We didn't really have a lot of information for that question, I remember. So yeah. thanks for contributing. Uh, and now we do. And one of these papers has some really cool uh, tomograms, ah, some neat. nice, nice uh, pictures. What is a tomogram? A tomogram uh, is uh, you take... Uh, and you take an electron microscope image, uh, usually, depending on the structure you're trying to image, a fairly thickest section. So you'll have most of uh, the sample in it. And you do it on a tilting stage, and you can tilt the stage through. Uh, it's not quite, it's, it's like... 270 degrees or something like that. I don't know. But you tilt it from 
one all the way to the other and it has and you take pictures at uh, intervals as you tilt the stage and it has the effect of basically optically serially sectioning the sample and then there's a whole bunch of uh, image reconstruction you can do to use that procedure to rebuild a three-dimensional image of whatever it is that you're imaging mm -hmm. and you can do this on uh, <clears throat> asymmetric structures and on single structures. It's not like uh, cryo-EM of symmetrical structures where you're taking a whole bunch of guys and doing averaging or something like that. You can do this on a, on a single uh, asymmetric structure. Mm -hmm. And you get out some pretty cool pictures. Yeah, these are cool. This is in the PLOS, path PLOS uh, Pathogens paper, right? Yeah. Yes. Great. Thank you, Connor. Next one is from... Noel or Noel? No, it must be Noel, right? N-O-E-L. I am an undergraduate and just signed up for a biology of viruses class. I, I am starting a little undergrad research with Candida albicans. I asked the professor in charge of my research if there were any viruses that infect C. albicans. We went on talking about how it's hard for a virus to break through the membrane to infect it, and there is little research about it. We figured out that we could do a little experiment using histone deacetylase inhibitors to manipulate the expressed genes, and we could possibly see viral DNA if it exists in the different strains of C. albicans we have. I am brand new to virology and brand new to research. I would personally be grateful if you did a twiv about viruses and fungi and maybe the modern techniques of research within this growing field. Well, uh, Noel, Noel... Uh, the only thing I know about viruses in these, uh, well, fungi, basically, I know there are viruses of Saccharomyces cerevisiae, right. but they don't make particles. They are they stay within. They're, they're double stranded RNA viruses that remain within the cell, and they're transmitted from cell to cell as the cell divides. And uh, maybe the problem with the cell wall is is one of the reasons why there isn't, you know, an extracellular phase for those viruses. I don't know of any DNA viruses in Saccharomyces. And I looked, and I didn't see any in C. albicans. So I'm not sure you'll find a DNA virus. If there are any, there may be these RNA viruses. Maybe the best way would be to um, either do some hybridization with the, the sequences from Saccharomyces or to uh, just, hey, extract total nucleic acids from C. albicans and deep sequence it. Sure. <laughs> Although that's not a little experiment, no. <laughs> but it's getting littler and littler. Yeah, it's a few thousand bucks at least. But. Uh, yeah, uh, I kind of looked around a little. It was hard to find much on these yeah. uh, critters. Um, and my sense is that there may be a couple of these that uh, can actually be transmitted, but I would have to confirm that <clears throat> by looking a little closer. The um, the uh, wiki entry on mycovirus has a nice little. Uh, example here it says an example of a true microvirus is the causal agents of Lafranc disease. <laughs> this is a disease that affects the edible mushroom Agaricus bisporus. It's also known as X disease, watery stripe, dieback, and brown disease. Uh, <laughs> symptoms include reduced Of course, it would yield. have a French name. Yeah, of course. These guys care about their mushrooms. <laughs> These are important. Symptoms include reduced yield. Slower aberrant mycelial growth, malformation, premature mass, uh, maturation, increased post-harvest deterioration, reduced shelf life, all gastronomic um, uh, maladies of one sort or another. At any rate. Yeah, it's a good question. Cool. Yeah, and, and in that case, you're dealing, that's a virus that infects a, um, uh, forget what the, um, the division is in the fungi, but that's, a, that's an actual mushroom, whereas Candida mm -hmm. albicans is a yeast. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, and and I think most of the work on on C. albicans has been more with a uh, with a medical slant. Um, this causes yeast infections in humans. Yeah. Um, so I think most of the of the work on it has been on how to kill it, and not so much its basic biology. Yeah. Right. I think uh, there's likely to be a virus if it yeah. hasn't been found. Sure. And yep. you just need to look. But, uh, of course, other fungi, We did when we were in Bozeman, Marilyn Rusink talked about this virus in a fungus in a plant. So the plant survives at hot springs at Yellowstone National Park, 
because it has a fungus in it, and the fungus has to have a virus in order for the plant to survive the high temperatures. So that's a virus of a fungus, different kind of fungus. Right. Actually, this would be another area where something like deep sequencing could be uh, of value. Sure. Take your Canada albicans and uh, sequence everything, yep. and I'll bet you're right. going to find some virus-like yeah. sequences in it. And in fact, it may have been done. Mm -hmm. I had a former colleague in my department, Aaron Mitchell, who used to work on Saccharomyces. He then switched to Candida albicans. I'll have to ask him. Maybe he would know, and maybe he would like to talk about it. Yeah. Uh, the next one is for Rich. Cheryl writes, Hello. I first wanted to say you guys make two excellent podcasts. Keep up the fantastic work. Because that's twib and twip, huh? Mm -hmm. I have a few questions. Can someone taking immune suppressants be at risk of developing cancer? If yes, how so? My guess is yes. Uh, I want to take that first. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, right? I would I think mean, so. I, I, because I can't quote you chapter and verse, but I believe that that's true. I mean, there is a surveillance, an immune surveillance that keeps tumor cells from growing in you normally. Right. right. So I would guess if you suppress that chemically or by an infection, you would be at increased risk. And in fact, uh, HIV infected patients have increased risk for s different kinds of cancers like Kaposi sarcoma and others. So I would say yes. What do you think, Alan? Uh, um, yeah, actually, there there are um, reports and and I believe statistics on this from the transplant community. Um, so people who've gotten organ transplants and are on uh, immunosuppressive drugs for that um, are uh, are apparently more likely to develop cancer, among other things. Right. Okay. Can you guys make an episode about the Tanapox virus? I worked in a virology lab at Western Michigan University, and the model there is Tanapox. I learned more basic lab techniques and watched the graduate students using Tanapox, but sometimes they were too busy and couldn't explain everything that they were doing. Nobody's too busy to explain everything they're doing, which I totally understand. No, you ought to slam those guys for that. I agree. Uh, so I would then try and read articles, but a lot of the time it became rather difficult as I had not taken any virology or immunology courses. I don't know. I just think it would be really neat to hear you guys discussing about it. It seems to me that viruses can uh, open doors to fight cancer and help detect other non-viral diseases. Right on. Sure. Um, so I'm going to come back to the Tanapox thing, okay? Yep. I obviously want to learn more about virology and immunology. And at the point where I've just graduated and I'm trying to find out exactly where I want to focus my energy, where do I want to do an internship, uh, where to find a job, perhaps continue my education. I need to read a lot more, although your podcasts are uh, a tremendous help. I think this article is also cool. Differential susceptibility of human cancer cell lines to wild-type Tanapox and Infection by Hui Lin Lee and Kareem Asani. Now, actually, if you read between the lines here and figure it all out, the lab where they're working on Tanapox at Western Michigan University that um, Cheryl is talking about is, in fact, Kareem Asani's lab. It's got to be. I also love the TWIV 101 uh, podcast. Also, I would really like it if the TWIP podcast was more than once a month. Sorry for quick changing subjects of this email. I hope some of it made sense. Cheers from Northern Germany. Cheryl. Okay. So Tanapox, actually, one of the best guys to ask about Tanapox is our uh, buddy, uh, Dr. McFadden, because mm. he's been involved in, uh, let me see, what sequence did he do? He did uh, the sequence of uh, Yaba monkey tumor virus. And uh, Asani's lab has worked on Yaba for a while. They're basically mining these things for uh, immune modulatory genes. Uh, but in, uh, I believe this is, uh, yes, in Asani's article, the one he quotes here, there's a nice summary of what these viruses are. Tanapox virus is, is a pox virus in the genus Yata pox virus. <laughs> Two species in the genus. Uh, one is Tanapox, uh, and the other is Yaba monkey tumor virus. 
And um, is that how it's? Is that why they're yatta pox, yabba monkey, and tana pox? Uh, yeah, must be, must be. And tana pox apparently is nobody knows where either of these guys lives normally. Tana pox uh, was originally isolated. Both were originally isolated in uh, Africa. Tana pox, I believe, in Kenya. It's thought to be a mosquito-borne disease that gives a limited pathology in humans. It's like a big vaccination, just a couple of lesions and goes away. And uh, Yaba, uh, or Yaba monkey tumor virus is a very unusual thing. I think it first showed up in monkey colonies, uh, though originally in Africa and sometimes elsewhere. And it had a funny disease it causes... Um, uh, histiocytomas, which are proliferations of Langerhans cells, dendritic cells uh, in the skin that are benign. They come up and they uh, go away. And these things on the uh, pox family tree form their own sort of clade off in the uh, pox sphere, off in a corner of the uh, pox sphere. Um, not real common. But uh, they're of interest uh, because they're great sources of immune modulatory proteins and et cetera. There's one chemokine binding protein that's uh, been uh, studied that has, or a couple of them that have uh, potential therapeutic value. So interesting virus. So let's get Grant on. Would he like get to Grant talk about on. it? Grant would love to talk about uh, these guys. Sure. Okay. I think we and should talk do about that. their uses. Get cool. it back on. Yep. All right. All right. Next one is for you, Alan. Uh, Mary writes, hi, gang. Just listened to episode 101 and thought of a good YouTube link that you may or may not be aware of. It's called Sugar, the Bitter Truth, which is a seminar given by Dr. Dr. Robert Lustig of UCSF. Uh, this seminar is a great combination of science, good and bad, politics, sociology, and epidemiology, making a solid case for sugar being a major culprit in today's obesity epidemic. As a scientist, virologist by training, I found this seminar very compelling, and I recommend this as viewing to anyone interested in this topic. I don't remember seeing this as anyone's pick on TWIV, so I thought I would pass this along. Watch it, and I would like to know what all of you think of it. Uh, keep up the good podcasts, Mary. So 101 was the adenovirus obesity episode, right? Ah, right. right. Okay. Sizing up adenovirus, yeah. Where I think we talked about high fructose corn syrup and, and obesity. Right. So I looked at this, and... It scared me, to be honest. So Lustig, he's he's a little um, dramatic, but he does show data. He goes through various articles, which and basically tries to uh, prove this link or provide evidence for the link between the use of high fructose corn syrup and obesity. And uh, he references the primary literature. He goes into biochemical pathways, which are possibly the reason for this. And I found right. it interesting. Now, I think if it's important to go to the literature. If you watch this and get interested, go to the literature and, and look at it yourself because of Absolutely. He, he could take a little bit from here and there and make it look really good. But if you went to the literature, you might find something else. I mean, I'm not saying that he did, but you should always do that. So don't just take a, a YouTube video. But I found it compelling, and I agree. Uh, with yeah, your it's assessment. a it's a very interesting. Um, it's a theory that he's not the only proponent of this, um, mm -hmm. and uh, the the nutshell version is there are solid biochemical reasons to believe that fructose uh, by itself or or in uh, you know delivered as a monomer um, with uh, with high fructose corn syrup, which is a mixture of fructose and glucose, uh, it's going to be metabolized differently from something like sucrose which is a disaccharide. It's the glucose and the fructose are joined together chemically. Um, and there's accumulating evidence that, uh, that the fructose is, um, is, does not trigger our satiety circuits, the, uh, um, the leptin. hormone response, the, mm. the leptin, leptin and everything yeah. that we write <clears throat> um, that tells us we've had enough to eat. Um, and it is, it is, is there true. something that tells you you've had enough to eat? Sure. I haven't experienced that. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, there's this, this hormone leptin that's supposed to be released when you've had enough and tell your brain to stop eating. Uh, right. Mine must be defective. Go ahead. But you're not. A, you're a skinny guy, Rich. What are you yeah. talking about? Well, I'm lucky in that way. Mm. Yeah, you got the metabolism for it. Well, yeah, the, so the, yeah, the idea is um, that uh, 
Americans in particular, um, but also a lot of people in other countries, are taking in more fructose than we used to, um, because previously you would only get this in small doses from fruit or you'd get it in honey, but people weren't drinking gallons of that. Uh, whereas high fructose corn syrup is in every kind of junk food you can name. Um, so uh, there's there's been an increase in uptake of it. It's been at about the same rate. You know, the curves line up nicely with the uptake of high fructose corn syrup by the food industry and also the rise in obesity. Um, and, and a lot of people uh, are completely persuaded that this is the prime cause of the obesity pandemic. I'm... I'm of the opinion that it is probably a contributor. Um, so I, I take a little more moderate view. I don't think we can point to a single cause and say this is the whole problem. I think there have also been, um, you know, demographic changes like in the way people work. Uh, we've tre- we've moved from uh, certainly in the industrialized countries from uh, people working in factories and making things, and in the past twenty, thirty years, we've moved to people sitting at desks and. Uh, you know, looking at various illuminated rectangles all day long. Um, mm-hmm. That's that's got to be a contributor. I, I can't believe that that has nothing to do with this. Right. So I'm reading a book by John um, Ingraham here, March of the Microbes, and he's got a chapter on high fructose corn syrup because it is in fact made from corn using three microbial enzymes, three different microbial fermentations. Really interesting story, which is topic for another podcast. But he says um, the sugar, uh, in response to glucose, the pancreas produces insulin, which induces the release of leptin, the hormone that signals that you're full. Insufficient leptin inevitably leads to obesity. For example, mice strains that are incapable of making leptin are obese. But the pancreas has no receptor for fructose. So fructose does not initiate the cascade that tells us we have had enough to eat. Right. Interesting. Is that true, Alan? Interesting. That, that uh, that's my understanding. That's... We, don't, we don't have receptors for fructose in the pancreas, yeah? I, I think that's correct. Okay. Anyway, check it out. It's uh, an interesting video. Thanks yeah. Thanks for that, Mary. Uh, the next one is from Sam, who writes, Thank you for your comments on this topic. I guess there was an email subject line, which I forgot to put here. <laughs> I love your program, having been a fan of Twit this week in tech, but not so enwrapped now. I find your podcast somehow as nourishing as chicken soup. <laughs> so I, I think he's not enwrapped with Twit, right? Right. Have you right. heard that? Send a chicken soup. <laughs> I, I think Twit is like chicken soup, right? Yeah. Cool. This topic is not going to go away, so maybe at some time you might do a program on the original viral breakthrough and how that paradigm shift has played out since then. I was surprised that DNA can be so precisely manufactured and ordered off the shelf even. This is the infrastructure that you guys are now laying, which will support future research and development. I think he was talking about the, the microbe, the creation of the microbe by, yes. by Venter, right? Right, yes. And we talked about how it was first done with viruses. And that's what he's referring to. I must say that the mechanisms and organisms involved lead me to think of cyborg as a really useful descriptor of current methodology. Some may hope to be completely synthetic by a certain date, but as you say, we really do not understand how to go down that route. Some are trying, though, and maybe you could comment on that in this program. It gives us a link to the Venter story. So he wanted us to talk a little bit bit about artificial viruses. I guess we have done that from time to time on... Twitter. Just kind of little no. bitlets here and there. Well, maybe we should have a little more detail at some point. To well, we ought to have you on the show, Vince. That's right. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. You could get me on the show sometime. That would right. be okay. We so, could, how did that happen? I could tell you. What we're talking about here is is um, making a DNA copy of any viral genome that is infectious. So it could be an RNA virus or a DNA virus. I went to do a postdoc with David Baltimore, and he says, "I want you to clone." polio virus, which is an RNA virus, and put it in a plasmid, a bacterial plasmid, and get it to be infectious. And then we can make viral mutants. And so that was the motivation, being able to make mutants. Yeah. It's what, that's what he said. Because you can manipulate the DNA copy of the yeah. genome. I mean, yeah, right. other... If you work on an RNA virus, you'd really rather work on a DNA virus. Yeah. So he that was his motivation. Of course, there are other things you can do as well. But he said, yeah, I think you should do this. I said, okay. So I, I cloned it. And um, it's a seven and a half kilobase RNA. It took me about a year to clone it and sequence it. I sequenced it myself. I mean, this is something I could do in a day now. I would send it out somewhere. 
So uh, was this Sanger sequencing that we're doing? <laughs> I did Max M. Gilbert. No kidding. You no. did the whole thing with Max M. Gilbert? The whole thing, both strands. With Holy Max cow. With Gilbert. I wow, poured all that's the gels. Heroic. I poured all the gels myself, these three-foot gels. And um, yeah, that is we had, you, prob uh, you probably still have this in your lab, the poster. Do you, do you have that that you made where you pasted the sequence together? Yeah, I do. I do. Have yeah, that. I remember we had that. Up, we had that up on the wall. Yeah, it used to be up on the wall. So uh, we got the sequence and we cloned everything. It took about a year to do that, and then I, I have the, had the whole genome cloned in the plasmid, and um, I said to David, "What do I do with this? Should I put a promoter in it that would make RNA?" And he said, "Nah, just throw it into cells. See what happens." <laughs> I said, "Okay." Good idea. So I did. And I got virus out. Just the first so, experiment. So you had no no promoter or anything? No, it was in a plasmid called PBR322, which is one of the first cloning vectors you could get. So it probably just got some sort of cryptic promoter that yeah. managed to make that's, a little RNA. That's what I think. First experiment. Cool. And, well, you deserved uh, it after all that sequencing and stuff. Yeah. Well, I don't know, but... It you worked. earned it. And um, that was it. And it was infectious. We published a paper in Science. And it was just a short paper with, I don't, I think it had one figure and one table, something like that. But uh, I got a job. That because of that, I got a job, <laughs> right? So then I went and gave job talks, and I said, "Look, I can do genetics with polio, and people like that." So, and that was the that was the first example of somebody doing something like this right? with an animal virus. Right. It had been okay. done before with a bacteriophage okay. by Charlie Weissman. So Charlie Fiex. Weissman took Q-beta, which was an RNA phage, made a DNA copy, put it in bacteria, and they made phage. So I gave a practice seminar at MIT, and um, I said this. You know, this is not the first time this has been done. Um, this is the first time for an animal virus, but it's been done by a phage. And someone came up to me after me and said, don't say that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> he was right. It was Fred Alt, actually. He said, just say it's the first time. It's You don't have to say it's the first time. People will know that it's really cool. So then after that, every other virus followed suit. You know, every mm -hmm. virus now has, uh, has an infectious DNA clone, both RNA and DNA viruses. And so I did this in 19, uh, 1980-ish, something like that. And so this is a long time ago. So viruses were the first to be synth synthesized, if you want to put it that way. For, and we called it, well, someone, um, Harold Schmeck was a New York Times science writer, and he wrote an article about this. And um, I remember he said, it's going to be on the front page of the New York Times, because he really liked it. And he said, poliovirus made from off-the-shelf chemicals. That's where this off-the-shelf comes from. Uh -huh. So I first, I read this. And I said, what is, what is this off the... And I said, okay, it's just a way of telling people, you know. You take, and it's true, really. It is off the shelf in a certain way. Yeah. The shelf is frozen. You know, it's a freezer. But uh, it never made the front page because that day, it was when it was scheduled to be published, the, sh the first shuttle was launched. Ah. Uh, so you whole, got shadowed out by the shuttle. <laughs> the whole front page was the shuttle, yes. Oh, we were on page 15 or something. And you fun. know what? You're still doing science, and they're about to shut down the shuttle. <laughs> that's right. Well, there you go. <laughs> that, that proves which was more important. Yeah, I there think. you go. So that's the story, Sam, for viruses. It's more complex because the, the viruses that followed. You know, we were very lucky that it worked. We just stuck the DNA in a plasmid and put it in cells, and it worked. And when other people tried that, it didn't work. In with fact, other viruses. With other viruses. But we had some competitors. Even people who tried it with polio after we did, it didn't work for them. They put the DNA at a different restriction enzyme site in the plasmid, and it didn't work. Wow. wow. And here's the weird thing. So we always talk on TWIV about how science, um, one paper is not enough to, to make something established in science. It has to be replicated, Right. It was four years before anybody did this again with polio. And in those four mm. years, people couldn't get it to work. And so what were people saying? I don't know if this is right. Right. What did Rack and Yell do? <laughs> yeah, right. And I started to hear this talk. And I'm like, hey. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really did it. I did it. But listen, this is what's happening with XMRV now, right? Yeah, right. right. So that's why you have to have patience. Let it, let it run its course. You have a paper. It says something, just let science run its course. It will take time. Sometimes it's slower than you want, but eventually you'll know if it's right or wrong. 
So and it doesn't always give the answers you want. It doesn't give. In, in my case, they confirmed it, and now it works for all viruses. So I think it's a good lesson in that sense. I'm still reeling from the idea that you did that whole thing by Maxim Gilbert. I mean, <laughs> that really is heroic. I've only done a few of those uh, reactions, and it's not straightforward. Yeah, but I loved doing that stuff. I, I really loved, I still love working in the lab. Well, there's nothing but, quite like reading a sequence off of yeah, a gel. Yeah, that's great. You know? I, wish I, I wish I hadn't thrown those out. Those are so cool, those gels. Uh, when I first got to, I did a sabbatical at uh, in Phil Sharp's lab at MIT. When I first got there, um, Claire Moore was just leaving. I took over her bench. And she had done a bunch of poly A assays and stuff. And so she had these, you know, pounds and pounds of these autoradiograms. And somebody for a going away present dug around in her stuff and made the coolest lampshade out of old autoradiograms. Oh, that's a great idea. It was really great. It was really cool. Nice. Yeah, I had, a, I had a big box of those under my bench by the time I graduated, but it was Sanger sequencing. That, uh, I, you know, <laughs> when... Uh, Reading sequencing gels, you know, and just going and sort of reading the sequence off of these things. I would catch, I did, you know, thousands and thousands of bases. And I would, no matter how many times I'd done it, I, I'd catch myself at times partway through this thinking, look at what I'm doing. Yeah. This is amazing. You know, reading off genetic code. It's amazing. Yeah. Just to take it one a little further, um, I used to read the gels and I would write it on a piece of paper. Oh. All right. I'd write it out and you know, you get, I don't know, three, four hundred bases. I'd read all the runs and then I'd go to a computer. But this was an old it was just a terminal. So at MIT they had a mainframe computer somewhere and we had terminals that we would connect by an acoustic coupler. You'd put the right. phone into phone. this thing. Right. And then you'd dial it up. Or something. Yeah. And I would connect and I know I'd type in that sequence that I had just written on a piece of paper into the program, which would then find all the overlaps. And then eventually I'd have to print it out and then check it against the gel again to make sure I didn't do any transcription. So errors. you did have some sort, of a, some sort of a rudimentary assembly program? Yeah, it was fine. It worked. You could overlap. You would do overlapping fragments of sequence, mm -hmm. and it would put them all together. Yeah, it was cool. And then after a year, I, I held up, I gave a lab meeting, and I held up this you know those old computer print out the fan paper the way right. with the holes on the edge. I held yeah. it up and it opened up like ten pages, and I said, "This is the sequence of polio." Cool. And uh, it was it was cool. Anyway, right. that's that. Enough of me. The next one is uh, from Jason. I think it's Rich's turn. Okay, Jason writes, "Hi there. I'm not a virologist." nor any other medical professional, but I am a TWIV listener. It's fun to expand my horizons every once in a while. I have a question about the influenza virus vac influenza vaccine. Should a person with a family history of autoimmune disease, specifically rheumatoid arthritis, avoid getting a flu shot? If not, do they run a higher risk of an autoimmune reaction? Take it, Vince. Well, yeah, the sure CDC this. says you should get a flu shot because you're You should at risk. get a flu shot, yeah. not avoid it. You should yeah. get one. Yeah. Right. So the idea is you're basically, if you got autoimmune disease, that's basically diagnostic of being at least mildly immune compromised uh, so that um, you're actually, that puts you at higher risk for complications from various and sundry infections. Am I, yeah. am I thinking about yeah. this right? Yeah. They also say on the CDC page that you should... You should not get flu mist, which is the um, live uh, attenuated virus, uh, that rather you should get the uh, inactivated virus, the injectable one. And I assume there is the same reasoning, okay? Mm -hmm. So you don't, you don't want to take a vaccine that is a live vaccine because if you're slightly immune compromised, you could get uh, theoretically complications from that, get the killed vaccine. Or right. inactivated vaccine. Yep. Right. The only, I think, the only contraindications to the uh, inactivated vaccine are if you have an egg allergy because it's made in eggs, um, or if you've had a uh, a problem with a previous um, flu shot, like a really serious complication, which is exceedingly rare. Mm -hmm. So there it is from the CDC. Okay, they say yep. there's even a, an arthritis organization that says the same thing, and they refer you to the CDC. So yes, and uh, it's interesting. Jason is a programmer. 
He's Red Hat certified, he's MySQL Pro certified, and MySQL Core certified. Cool. Yep. We get a lot of computer nerds writing in. Yeah. yeah. Great. You know? I think it's great. It's great. Thanks. Uh, next one's from Bunny. Alan. Uh, Bunny writes, Dear Professors et al. Oh, I got promoted. <laughs> uh, can't help... <laughs> Can't help but think of HeLa cells during each episode I listen to now after having read about Henry, Henrietta Lacks' immortal life. What a delight uh, What a delight to find my favorite pod, podster referred to in the book. Makes me curious if there's anything any of you could add to the story. I'm curious about the continued use of these cells, ethical issues regarding the use of cells obtained in this manner, or anything else you might want to comment on to fill in the next chapter, so to speak, of this science story. Keep up the chatter, enjoy the show a great deal, and who couldn't love a podcast hosted by guys with names making them sound like rivals straight out of a romance novel? Alan Dove. Vincent Racaniello. I don't know about Racaniello, but Dove is I don't definitely know. out of a romance novel. <laughs> you think so? I don't know about Rich Condit, though. No, but that you just know, doesn't make it If she all. likes it, that's fine. That's yeah, fine. That's good. To Alan, what do you think about the, the use of Gila's? You know, they were well, not taken, you know, the right way. But for 1950, there was no right way to take them. Exactly. Right? I read the book, and, um, you know, obviously the author had a particular uh, view of things and, and delved much more deeply into the into the life of Henrietta Lacks' family um, than anybody else ever has. Um, and it is certainly unfortunate <laughs> that the cells were taken without modern standards of informed consent and you know this was all uh handled in in the way that it was and perhaps that was not optimal um but i i don't buy into this sort of um uh i don't know this retroactive application of our modern standards to past times I, there there were certainly things that happened in the past that were repugnant but um in this case, you know, Henrietta Lacks went to the hospital at Johns Hopkins um, and was treated there. And I think it's important to remember that the reason she went to the hospital at Johns Hopkins to be treated was because being black, there weren't very many doctors who would actually treat her for anything. Uh, there was just no medical care um, for people of, of her race, uh, which is that's the problem. Um, but then Hopkins had actually set up a ward um, to, uh, you know, to address this. And she she would have gotten some treatment there, but uh, it was her cancer was too far developed to really do much good. Uh, they took a biopsy. They got these cells. And uh, yes, these cells then formed uh, the backbone of a lot of subsequent biological research. Um, I... I, I'm not persuaded that there was that there's an ethical problem with continuing to work on these. I, I would agree. I don't think I don't have uh, I don't have any ethical issues with continuing to work on them. And I think there's you know there's a couple of I have not read the book. I need to do this. Um, uh, but just based on my own experience, I would say I would look at a couple of pieces of, uh, of good news out of this. Um, the cells uh, were in and of themselves. An enormously important uh, bit of research, and have continued to be uh, very important. And I would also take heart in the fact that um, the ethics have progressed since that point uh, to the to what we have now, where um, we now perceive of that as ethically flawed originally, and we have uh, uh, procedures to uh, you know address that in the current context. So. Yeah, and I, and I think um, in addition to applying the standards of the time, and, and I think by the standards of the time, this was handled appropriately. We just have evolved our standards. Um, the uh, This was not a Tuskegee type of situation where yeah. even by the standards of the time, that was flat wrong. Um, so I, I think that's the appropriate lens to look at it through. And, and yeah, it's, it's an unfortunate story that um, she was not acknowledged or... Uh, um, you know, in any way, uh, her family wasn't even aware uh, that this was going on, and I understand some of them have some problems with it. Um, but that, uh, I think, is water under the bridge. Marginally related to this, I can't ship my BSC-40 cells, African green monkey kidney cells, I can't ship them out of the country because African green monkeys are an endangered species. 
okay? These cells have been in culture for 40 years. They're so far removed from the monkey, you know, forget it. So uh, we, 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 have a, we have a tendency sometimes to sort of go overboard yeah. with this stuff. And I think HeLa cells are far enough removed from that original unfortunate uh, uh, incident so that there's not a continuing problem here. Well, for, for what it's worth, Bunny, um, I, I continue to grow HeLa cells in my lab. And have, having read the book, whenever I, I split them three times a week, and I always think of the story whenever I pick up that, that jar of cells. Yeah, that's the other good thing, is that, uh, is that the book was written. Yeah. Yes. All right? And, and you know, to acknowledge all this. It's a huge bestseller. It's, still, it's been a year on the New York Times bestseller list. So a lot of people have read it, and I think that's good that everyone that's knows good. this story. Yeah, yeah. Now, one thing you might be interested in, Bunny, um, if you're still listening, uh, about oh months ago, I, I went to the uh, I went to the University of Pennsylvania Hospital. They have the Infectious Disease Division has a monthly book club, and one month, they what they do is they get together over dinner and they talk about a book. So they picked Henrietta, the Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, and they invited me to go down. Mm. And they had a very a number of very interesting people, and I recorded the conversation. It was about oh. thirty people, ID people, and other people in a room. I recorded it. There were some very interesting opinions. It was very, it got very contentious at some point, hmm. and I would like to make it a TWIV episode at some point <laughs> when that I would get be around, cool. when I get around to editing it, because there was one individual, I think a professor from Princeton, who whose specialty is. Um, racial aspects of health care, you know, as you had mentioned, Alan, how that still continues this to this day. Right. And then there were some other people that had different... It was a very interesting discussion. I think our audience would love it, so I will try and edit it at some point to get it up as a... As that would episode. be cool. So you might like that. Yeah. We process about six liters of healers a week. Oh, yeah? Know? Oh, yeah. We're constantly growing virus. With yeah. uh, growing big batches of virus, so we got healers growing all the time and growing them up in big batches and in, infecting them and salting this stuff away in the freezer for purifications. Yeah, so we I have a a liter spinner growing, we split it three times a week. We use it for plaque assays, growing virus. It's great. They just keep on growing. They're so thanks, Henrietta. Yeah. Yes. All right. The next one is from. Next email is from Mudaliar. He is a PhD student in India. He writes, Respected sir, I am a PhD scholar working in virology. I would like to know what MOI, multiplicity of infection, I should use to infect cells so that one, all cells are infected. Two, high amplification of virus is achieved when strictly one replication cycle of virus is permitted. And three, no defective interfering, interfering particles are achieved. Eagerly waiting your kind response. Mudalia, I hope you're not waiting to do an experiment for my <laughs> or, or turn in a homework assignment <laughs> because uh, this has been around for a while. But I thought we should still answer it because it's an interesting mm -hmm. question. Great question. Yeah, I just taught uh, the, the my virology class about multiplicity of infection, and um, they're probably wondering why they had to know this. Here's my analogy. I love this. You have a room with a hundred buckets. And then you hold 100 tennis balls. If you threw them all at once, if you could do that, each bucket is not going to get one ball. There's some kind of statistical distribution, and that's what we use to figure out MOI. If you use an MOI of 10, which means you add 10 viruses per cell, every cell doesn't get 10 viruses. It's, just, it's some kind of a distribution. And so there's a formula, the Poisson distribution that you use to calculate that. An MOI of 10 will basically infect all of your cells, and there's, there's a, I'll, I'll put a link to a, a post that I wrote about this. You can see the formula. Um, and, and in that post, someone had said, what's the minimum MOI that you need to infect all the cells? I think that was someone who had an exam question, and I calculated it was 4.7 or something like that. What do you think, Rich? Uh, yeah, I like my little, uh, I've, I've also just recently taught this, plus, uh, uh, it's in that uh, fields chapter, and I um, I like this little uh, uh, table I uh, sent you. So the the answer is that a multiplicity of one, there's still 37 percent of the cells that are uninfected. At a multiplicity of three, you infect 95 percent of the cells. 
at a multiplicity of five, you infect 99% of the cells. So I usually figure that if I really want to get everybody infected, I ought to use at least a multiplicity of three. Yeah. I also figure that my titers are probably only accurate within a factor of about two because you do a serial dilution to obtain the titers and there's a lot of error in that. So I figure if I'm aiming for a multiplicity of three and my titers are off by a factor of two, I might only be at 1.5, in which case I'm going to have a lot of uninfected cells. So just to make sure, I'm going to go for at least five and usually ten. And I don't want to go a whole lot higher than that because even though in my system I don't have much evidence for it, I'm a little af uh, afraid that if you step on the cells too hard, you're actually going to hurt them and compromise uh, your virus yields or whatever out the other end. Right. So that sort of answers this two, in fact, uh, two first questions. In order to infect them all, I'd go for at least five, maybe ten. Uh, and I wouldn't go much higher than that in case that actually hurts things. However... His last condition presents a problem because if you want to discourage, and this is it, this makes a actually, hmm, this would make a great exam question. <laughs> I wonder. Uh, unfortunately, this twib's going to go up before I give my exam. I want. Oh, that would be good because I don't know how many of those students listen to twib. Tell them, <laughs> hey, tell, tell them to listen. <laughs> That's okay. So. Um, if you, if, when you do a high multiplicity infection, that encourages the growth of defective interfering particles. Because if you have multiple viruses in a cell, that means that one of them can go bad and be helped in its replication by another one that's in the cell. If you really want to discourage the accumulation of uh, defective interfering particles, you need to do a really low multiplicity where no cell gets more than one virus. And that's that's way that you so the three is incompatible with one and two. You can't really uh, do an infection to discourage defective interfering particles and infect all the cells at the same time. Right. Of course, it depends on the virus also. It depends on the virus. Some of them don't make defective yeah. interfering. So particles. polio, we don't worry because it's really really hard to make defective particles. Yeah, vaccinia, you don't have to worry much either. So uh, last year, I started working on influenza virus and. I just did what I automatically do with polio to make a stock. I just put on a very high MOI on cells, and I didn't get any virus out. And oh, it's that bad. It's that bad with flu. You cannot use a high MOI infection to make a virus stock. You can do it to study the infectious cycle, but you have to go way less than one, an MOI of one for flu to make a good virus stock. You yeah. know, maybe we ought to do this on a TWIV 101 and go over the whole von Magnus effect. Yeah, sure. It's really interesting. MOI... Particle to PFU ratio. Yeah, the whole, yeah. Sure. The whole thing. We could do that. Okay. The next one is from Doug. I think it is Rich's turn. Okay. Doug writes, I have a question regarding your discussion of the rapid rate of spread of the obesity epidemic. You commented that the change in diet could not account for the rapid rate. However, there was no discussion of the introduction of genetically modified foods, which has somewhat paralleled the obesity epidemic. Do you think there's any possibility that genetically modified foods may be contributing to the rise in obesity? Hamish mentioned that there was no high fructose corn syrup in Europe, but he didn't mention that there is also no genetically modified food in Europe. Thanks, Doug. Um, I do not uh, myself believe that genetically modified foods have anything to do with the obesity epidemic. I have no uh, data one way or another, but I don't see how there could be a connection. Yeah, uh, I did. In, in the case of HFCS, there's a very clear physiological mechanism that you can you can say, okay, here it is, this is how that would work. In the case of GM foods, I, I mean, every crop that's been grown by humans for the past 10,000 years has been genetically modified. Uh, what's happened in the past uh, 15 years is that we've started doing the genetic modifications in a different way. Now there are I, that's there there are some potential differences, and I would agree that maybe the way the USDA and EPA handled those approvals in the U.S. could have been uh, more transparent and a little more discussion about it. But um, that, be that as it may, I I really have a hard time imagining that um, this would explain any aspect of the obesity epidemic and also the timing's not quite right 
Um, we started seeing the rise in obesity uh, in the early 90s, and um, the GM crops were not introduced until the late 90s. So it, it doesn't really line up. This uh, letter contains the uh, classic uh, uh, phony epidemiology uh, trap, though, that there's the introduction of genetically modified foods has somewhat paralleled the obesity epidemic. You know, there's a correlation, but right. that doesn't prove anything. That doesn't prove cause and effect. My favorite is, and I've quoted several times before, the sale of ice cream cones is directly proportional to the number of drownings on any given day. Yes. So does ice cream cause you to drown? Rich, when you, when you said before, I don't think, I don't feel that GM foods cause obesity, but I don't have the data. It reminded me of Seth Mnookin and the thing about truthiness. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, who's, who said that? Stephen Colbert. Stephen, yeah. Calls about truthiness. You, you right. just feel it's right. You don't have right. any reason. but <laughs> Right, right. <laughs> right. So be That's careful, my... Rich. Okay. <laughs> I don't, you know, I'm sure right. you, you've, you've got some basis. Well, at least for... I qualified it. Yeah, I don't want people to think that we're being truthiness because we right. were very critical. Right, and I, and I should add, it is not impossible that that's a factor. It's right. just it, there's no biology behind it. The burden is on somebody advocating that theory to come up with some kind of mechanism, and I don't see what that mechanism would be. Yeah, I mean, there has to be. There's so many ways to modify foods that yeah. it would seem that there's no nothing common that would lead to. And, and also, we have we have mountains of data showing that um, people in industrialized countries are now consuming more calories than they used to and expending fewer calories than they used to. So we, we don't really need to reach for a whole lot of uh, exotic explanations right. here. Uh, you know, something's making people eat more. All right, uh, Alan, the next one, please. So Charles writes, Dear Twiv team, could I start by saying how much I enjoy your podcasts? Yes, you could. Sure. Yeah. I'm a 51-year-old software engineer in York, England, who gave up chemistry at age 16 and biology even earlier when I was only 11. And yet, listening to TWIV, I'm developing a deep interest in virology. I love your camaraderie and the way you bring complicated topics down to a level which even I can start to understand. Listening to one of your fa recent podcasts, you mentioned double-stranded circular DNA. The question I would like to ask is, if a strand of DNA had complementary ends, say a GTAG at one end and a CATC at the other, uh, whether where it's possible for for it to join its ends together using base base pairing so that it ends up some, somewhere in between being single and double stranded. I suppose the end case for this would be a strand of DNA in the form of a Mobius loop. Please keep your podcasts coming. Kindest regards, Charles. And I, I think um, you'd have to have a lot more complementarity than that to get a stable and yeah, base pairing, the, yeah. the stable base pairing and the structure you're talking about, but um, the the upshot of complementarity, if you had a little bit of a single-stranded sequence that's complementary at each end, you could circularize the DNA, uh, and that is certainly possible. You can get circular double-stranded DNA. So he said a strand of DNA had complementary ends, so I assume it's linear. And right. So yeah, they would hybridize, right, Rich? Yeah. And, if and you, you made can the circularize it. The interesting thing about here is that this, uh, now this is an interesting problem too. The uh, He talks about the end case would be uh, DNA in the form of a Merbius loop. Now that's not going to work because right. that would be a half a turn that violates the polarity rules. If if I'm thinking about this right, you'd be trying to join a five prime end with a five prime end and right. a three prime end with a three prime end and that the chemistry doesn't work. Right, you can't actually get that to uh, to stick together. But but if you had a single strand, you could circularize it with this complementarity. That would be fine, right? Uh, I uh, let me think here. Because it's yeah. five three prime. Yes. So sure. okay, I see what you mean. So if you have a single strand of DNA with appropriate complementarity at the ends, could you circularize it? Yeah, I think that works. Sure. And if it's yeah. longer, complementarity would be more yes. stable. Yeah. Yes. That yeah, works. you're just you're just ligating a plasmid. Right. Well, you're not ligating. It's just two. It would be in this you're case four letting, base pairs right. of, of. You're letting you're letting the complementarity yes stick together. Stick if you together. added ligase, then you would ligate it into a. Well, into you a no, you couldn't remember because you have to have adjacent three and five prime ends to ligate. Oh, so you'd right. have to fill it in. You could use a DNA polymerase to fill in the rest of. No, the, wait a minute. Right? I don't. Th I'm just drawing this now. I don't think it works. No. <clears throat> no, because uh, it winds up being. 
uh, where you, if I'm thinking about this right, you want to take a single strand, right? Yeah. And you want to fold that in kind of a spiral, looking for a complementarity in the overlap. Is that what you're trying to do? No, just just take the two ends and and will they base pair? Uh, well, if you try an overlap, if I'm if uh, if it's if I'm be, thinking about this right, if you draw that as an overlap where one end overlaps with the other, you wind up violating the anti-parallel rules. Yeah, you do. But if it's double stranded, it would be okay. Well, I think what's going to happen is that it's going to form a, a stem loop. Ah, you could do that. You could make a panhandle, yes. Yeah, you flip the polarity yes. around so right. that they match. Okay, um, that would work. Right, you could and make a panhandle. And then that would work, and you'd get, you'd get sort of a, a big lollipop. And, in right. fact, that's exactly what adenovirus does during yeah. its replication. It's got complementarity right. at the ends. You peel off a single strand, and it makes a panhandle. That works. So, if so you were... would not get a Mobius loop. You would get uh, just the, the ends stuck together in a sort of lollipop stick. Right. Right. But is he I think he's talking about double stranded DNA, in which case if you had single stranded ends, they yeah, would they would anneal. Right. If and you yes, in that case you're circularizing a plasmid. And right. then that you would be right, Al, and then you could ligate. Then you could ligate it. Right. Exactly. And I suspect he's talking about double stranded, not not single stranded. All right. I hope that's not too confusing. We <laughs> we ended up at the right place. This is how yeah. science works. Right. That's right. Okay. Who who read that? I can't remember. Uh, Alan. I that. Alan so did. that means I am next. Is that You're right? Up. I believe so. Sheldon, although they aren't viruses, can you please explain how virus like particles are created and used in vaccines like Gardasil and Cervarix and that are being developed for flu vaccines? And he gives us an article. It seems somehow magical that you can build something that is structurally a virus on the outside but is essentially an empty shell and that VLPs may be better than inactivated vaccines because you get all of the outside of the virus rather than perhaps just broken parts like the split virion flu vaccine or selected parts, the subunit flu vaccine. Thanks. Sheldon is from Toronto. And you put it perfectly. It is magical. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. The virus proteins are magical because if you express them in either eukaryotic cells or insect cells or yeast, which I think the Gardasil and Cervarix, one is in yeast and one is in insect cells, they, they automatically, spontaneously assemble into a capsid because all the information is there in the protein. Uh, yep. so I think the uh, papilloma, the home, human papilloma, it's one protein that they express, correct? I believe that's correct. And it assembles into a capsid. Flu yeah, it's, too. Like, it's like a bag of magnets. They're going to stick together in a particular orientation. Exactly. And for flu, the virus-like particles in flu, uh, this uh, is this one looking at the plant. Virus no, the one he, the one he, uh, the one he sent is uh, it's a baculovirus, Baculo. I think, in, in insect cells. But flu is cool. All you have to do is express the hemagglutinin, one glycoprotein. It causes particles to bud and come out of the cell, and that's kind of magical. It's a totally different thing because now you have a mem a membrane vesicle with this glycoprotein in it. Um, and those are being made in plants, too. Right. In fact, we had a paper queued up a couple of weeks ago. We didn't get to, but those are in clinical trials. So it is all in the primary sequence of the protein, right? They have a sequence that spontaneously allows the, the proteins to fold and assemble into a capsid. And it, and it really is magical. And it really is better than other kinds of vaccines for exactly why you say, Sheldon. We should keep that paper in the queue, too, because it's got some really cool stuff in it. Yeah, I, I, I will do that. All right, the next is from our friend Eric Delwart. Rich. So, Eric writes, Dear Twiv, while not strictly speaking a virology story, the paper describing a laboratory-selected bacteria able to replicate in the absence of phosphate but with arsenic appears to show that even the basic structure of DNA can rapidly evolve to a new shape. That rather remarkable and surprising conclusion, if confirmed, indicate just how flexible our genetic material can be not only in sequence but in actual chemical composition. Amazing conclusions require amazingly strong evidence, and at this point skepticism is probably warranted, but it would certainly be interesting to see what a double helix or a tRNA with its phosphate replaced by arsenic would look like and how they could possibly function. 
On face value, the NASA researcher appeared to have selected a life form stranger than all those previously known whose genetic information is coded by a different form of DNA. It does remind us that viral RNA and DNA genomes can also be extensively chemically modified and yet still function perfectly well enough, although a modification of their backbone forming phosphate connections has never been reported. And he uh, sends us that science article, which we talked about some time ago. Uh, when it first came out and has been actually, you know, a topic of a lot of conversation. What's the latest on that? I haven't really followed it. There's I mean, still a lot of debate. Yeah, so the authors have made some statements, and they say the paper didn't say everything that the press is saying, and that it said, what it says is supported by the data, but we're working on more experiments to make it more conclusive, basically. So, you know, they, uh, there are a lot of holes in it, apparently. It's not even proven that these bacteria are using arsenate because you can't rule out that there's some phosphate in the medium. What, what I couldn't get out of that uh, paper that I really wanted to know is, you know, I, I wanted to take the DNA and somehow analyze it and tell me uh, what percentage of the phosphates in the DNA are actually replaced yeah. by arsenic. Yes. And I, I could not get that. No. Yeah, out of the that, paper. No. So they say they're doing this, you know, but, you know, maybe it should have been sent back for more experiments. Well, I think what should have been sent back for more review was the NASA press release. Because um, <laughs> the, the paper itself is not as far out there as, as a lot of the statements have been made about it. And, and those all stem from the, uh, uh, the way this came to public attention. We've had this conversation before. Yes, we have. <laughs> I think that's fair. If you took the press release away, then maybe there wouldn't be as much sensationalism over the paper, right? Exactly. The paper would have come out. It would have been. Uh, it, it is an interesting finding. You know that that something can survive in this much arsenic is pretty darn cool, um, and that it appears to actually maybe metabolize some of it is also pretty darn cool because this is a toxic, heavy metal that is thought to kill everything. Um, so that is interesting science, and uh, you know whether it belongs in science is a matter for the editors of science to to debate. But um, there's uh, there's clearly something interesting going on here that deserves further investigation. But then the whole, you know, the the not only the press release, but the fact that it it partially leaked in advance, and then that created this enormous uh, storm of hype um, that certainly caused a lot of these problems. I think. Okay, thanks, Eric. Uh, the next one is Alan. Yes, from Jing, who writes, Dear Virologists, I'm a graduate student at Boston University Department of Biophysics, and I work on structural basis for poliovirus replication. Mm -hmm. I love your podcast, great work, and I really appreciate the time and effort you put into it. The topics of whether viruses are alive or not has occurred in your show multiple times. Has it? <laughs> <laughs> I think we may have mentioned that once or twice. Yeah. Uh, he says, I'd like to view life in the structural prospect. That is, anything that has the ability to decrease its entropy is alive. Since viruses encode proteins that self-assemble into highly organized capsids, they turn randomness into order, they have the glory of life. Oh, it's interesting. Uh, yeah. So what do you I think, think, guys? A... You know, when now, I clean I've, up I've my... Been... Yeah, I've been trying to come up with examples of something that decreases its own entropy that's clearly not alive. And it's, right, and I can't think of something. It's kind of tricky. What were you going to say, Vincent, when you clean up? When I clean up my room, I'm decreasing the entropy, but I'm doing so, that, and I'm alive. Well, and you're, decreasing, yeah. you're also decreasing the entropy of the room. Yeah, but this is something doing its own. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's acting on itself. Right. Hmm. Now, of course, it causes a net increase in the entropy in the universe, but that's just thermodynamics. Um, but when something Vincent has, cleans up his room, I can feel the net energy <laughs> entropy uh, increase in the universe all the way down here in Florida. It requires a lot of energy. It's a really interesting. <laughs> this is a really interesting uh, way yeah, to look is. at it. Yeah, I, it is. I, I, it's I totally novel. That. I've never heard of this before. Let's throw it out to our listeners. Tell us what yeah, you think. Yeah, oh, good idea. What do you think about that? I like that, Jing. Yeah, I, I really like that, too. I, I, I hadn't heard that either. But virus particles are not alive because they don't do this. They don't self-assemble. It's only in the infected cell 
that they do this. Ah, okay. Right? So that's going back to your other yeah. twist on this, that the particles aren't alive, it's the infected cell. Is, right, yeah. Because it's in the infected cell that the particles mm -hmm. are assembling and, you know, into this organized capsid. But okay, that's fine. Right. So is, is your car alive because it, uh, it assembled in a factory? Yeah, but it didn't, didn't self-assemble. It, it didn't yeah. do it itself. It didn't did self, it. exactly. People did it, right. That's the key here. Well, we'll, we'll keep it in mind as we go through these discussions and see if, yeah. it, see if it holds up. Uh, the next one is from Luke. Hello, TWIV hosts. I know that there is a fair amount of work being done looking for therapeutic molecules in both plants and bacteria. Considering that viruses have to modulate the host response, I would imagine that they would also be a good source for such molecules. Are people looking into viruses for these kinds of things? And if so, what are the ways they go about it and what kinds of pitfalls are encountered? Thanks for the entertaining show. You hear a lot about scientists, about how scientists don't do enough to communicate their work to the general public, and this podcast format is a great way to remedy that problem. So we just talked about Tanapox virus as a yeah. source for these immunomodulators, mm -hmm. right? Right. Yeah. So, how, Rich, and how do they go about looking for these things in a viral genome? Uh, well, nowadays, I think it's uh, a lot of it is just by homology searches of one sort or another. Is that right? Well, no, not necessarily, because you can wind up with, uh, you can isolate virus mutants that uh, are have altered virulence in an animal model, and it turns out that the altered, you know, investigating these, it turns out that the altered virulence is because they're missing some sort of immunomodulatory factor. And then when you investigate that further, right. you find out what part of the immune system it's tweaking. And then you realize that it has like anti-inflammatory properties or something like that. And then you go, oh, that might be useful. Yep. Uh, alternatively... Uh, nowadays, you can. We know enough about a lot of these molecules so that you could uh, take a uh, a virus genome and sequence it, and just by bioinformatics look at the sequences and say, "Oh, you know, I'll bet you that's a protein that binds some sort of chemokine or something like that." I mean, there's a limited amount of this that can be done, and then investigate that further and see if it actually has immunomodulatory properties. So, yeah. both kinds of ways. I guess some of the pitfalls are. They might not work when you give it to yeah. an animal by themselves, sure. right? Right. Or they might work too well and mm -hmm. cause bad side effects. Mm -hmm. But I suspect when we have Grant on to talk about Tanapox, we can go into this. Uh, that's a good idea. We okay. can, yeah, we'll, we would do that whole thing. Yep. I think he's working on one of those immunomodulators. Mm -hmm. I think it had something to do with arthritis, right? Uh, well, yeah, there is a uh, one of the Tanapox uh, immunomodulatory proteins. Uh, Binds and, inact binds and inactivates uh, tumor necrosis factor, TNF. Mm -hmm. The uh, treatment now for both, I believe, arthritis and Crohn's disease uh, is a monoclonal antibody that uh, binds TNF, which is a notorious uh, inflammatory, pro-inflammatory uh, molecule. Right. So and if you can bind TNF, uh, you can uh, reduce the inflammation in those diseases. And this Tanapox protein... Uh, does that in spades much better than the uh, monoclonal antibodies that are mm. available. Right, and those those monoclonals were actually a little bit of a hard sell uh, for physicians because of the name of TNF, um, uh, which is which is one of the worst named molecules in in all of biomedicine. I think it's tumor necrosis factor, yeah. and so there's this perception: well, you're going to give somebody uh, an antibody that sops up this thing that kills tumors, right? Uh, but it's not it's not really a helpful molecule to have a lot of floating yeah. around. That's why, that's like, uh, we, that's the, the reason we call, I mean, magnetic resonance imaging. Yes, is, an is actually <laughs> nuclear magnetic resonance, <laughs> right. but you can't say nuclear. Right. right? Yes, <laughs> that's right. All right. Thanks, Luke. And I think we should move on now and go into our picks of the week. And can't we go for another couple hours? These are great letters here. <laughs> yeah, they are could. great letters. Um, we will save them for next time. Okay. Be there. Yeah, there are, a bunch, there are a bunch more. I always put more than I think we can get to. I put more than we can get to. And the other ones are great, but we'll, we'll have them next time. Uh, let's do some picks, and let's start with Rich. Uh, okay, so... 
This is a pick that was sent to me by uh, one of our ex-students who I am still in touch with that is uh, in the process of, it's a YouTube video that is already in the process of going viral. I've seen it pop up a couple of places on It's Facebook. coming up on all the, all the science blogs yeah, now. Right. But, I mean, we got to do it. It's a, a video from a lab in Baylor, the Zeng Lab in Baylor. And it's a, a music video that is a parody of a Lady Gaga video of the, her song Bad Romance. And this is called Bad Project. <laughs> and it's basically about somebody who's having a miserable time in the lab because they're on a bad project. And I have to say, they've really done an amazing job with this. It's very, it, it is a hoot, yeah. Uh, it is very imaginative. It's got all of the uh, awful stuff that you deal with on a bad project. And they, you know, they got all the choreography. They got costumes. They got Lady Gaga dressed up in biohazard bags and lab mat and stuff like that. It's really terrific. And the whole and the choreography is actually quite good. They've yep. done a good job they, of this. They spent some time on this. They spent some time on it. I must confess that basically, being an old codger, I didn't know a whole hell of a lot about Lady Gaga. I mean, I know of her and that kind of stuff. So I did my research on this. I went to Wikipedia. I found out about Lady Gaga in some detail. I looked up a bunch of pictures. Then I went to YouTube and found the original Lady Gaga video of uh, Bad Romance, and that put it in appropriate context for me. Mm. Very good. Don't go to her website. Uh, I, okay, I won't. <laughs> I didn't know there was a song called Bad Romance, so I didn't quite get the parody. I liked yeah. the video, but I wasn't, you know, a parody is of something else. Well, so. you got it. It's probably it's probably worth it to go watch Bad Romance, yeah. so that you're kind of you're kind of up with the whole thing here, and it uh, puts the parody in in better context. It makes it that, better. Uh, they have a whole Zang Lab uh, channel on YouTube. They've made a lot of other videos as well. Apparently, hmm. um, they're spending some time doing this. Uh, it's all in their spare time, by the way, taxpayers. Okay, <laughs> yes. they aren't they aren't wasting your taxpayers' yeah. dollars on this. Yeah, well, we... And it's a nice example of the fact that uh, scientists actually have a sense of humor yeah. and some real creativity. No, I think it's great. I mean, we do podcasts, and they do these videos, which they you know you're in a lab, you can see what they're doing, and and you can see all the equipment and lots Jeez, of little tubes. Like... It's cool. Looks like this thing has had nearly a million hits. That's amazing. You know, I put up uh, Twiv and I get, I'm happy to get 400 hits. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess entertainment always trumps education, right? Yeah. Alan, what do you have for us? Uh, well, my pick is a short little book, really more of a pamphlet. It's about 44 pages long um, from the National Academies Press, which is not normally known for its uh, highly readable texts, but... <laughs> <laughs> this is a um, uh, this is just a neat little book called "What You Need to Know About Infectious Disease," and it's aimed at uh, a lay audience, just the average person. It's well written, it's well put together and produced. You can download the free PDF of it um, on the website, and this is your taxpayer dollars at work. This is the National Academies um, uh, put this thing together. Um, from their, uh, I guess, uh, Madeline Drexler with the Institute of Medicine uh, Office of Communication and um, pulled information from various National Academies reports and, and kind of synthesized it all. And um, it's just a really good basic explanation, as I say, for it's for a lay audience, but I think this should be required reading to graduate from high school. It's just... It starts off by pointing out that microbes are everywhere, and the overwhelming majority of them are either beneficial to us or not harmful. And then the minority of them that are infectious, here's, here are the categories of them, uh, here are how they, they behave differently, here's where emerging diseases can come from, um, and uh, just a really good synopsis of exactly what the title says what you need to know about infectious disease hmm. this does good. look very good it looks very yeah. good i'm glad they did this good yeah. for them nice we i just downloaded it. i'm looking at it 
Yep. And, and if cool. anybody's put off by reading 44 pages, I'll point out there are pictures in it, too. So yeah. As a matter of fact, I was looking at the pictures. Pages. It's, yep. it's nice laid out. It's a good production. Yep. Piece. Very nicely done. Cool. Thank you, Alan. That's great. Uh, my pick is an article uh, in the New York Times, which describes the creation of a federal research center to develop drugs of all sorts, and I assume drugs for various diseases, to treat diseases, and probably antivirals and antimicrobials as well. So the administration has put aside um, a, a few billion dollars, I believe. Actually, I think it's just one billion for one billion? seed money. Yeah. And they're going to they... build a building at the NIH, right? On the campus yep. of the NIH. It's going to be called the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences. And they'll search for drugs where the big pharma doesn't want to get involved. Maybe they don't think there's a market or whatever the reason. Um, now, I think this is great. This is something I've always thought about. I've always had a problem with drugs and vaccines being a for-profit industry. And I've always thought it would be good to have institutes that at least initiate the search for them. Now, my friends in the pharma industry tell me I'm naive and don't know how it works and that in a, in a free market economy, you have to have companies developing drugs. But here we go. The government, this administration anyway, thinks that it might work to have a, a government-run institute to at least initiate some robotic screens and find some hits and then maybe hand it off to uh, commercial uh, enterprises. Well, and what they're doing with this, it's not actually a complete government-run um, uh, develop the drug from start to finish type of effort. They're they're addressing the place where private industry has has demonstrably failed in recent years. So they're they're actually stepping into a gap that in the drug industry people have been talking about and talking about and nobody knows what to do about it. And that is you get something that looks promising in basic research, but nobody wants to touch it with a 10-foot pole until there are some better preclinical data. Right. And some maybe even some advanced, some um, like uh, early phase one clinical trials um, because the drug industry has been spending many, many billions of dollars and a rising proportion of their revenues on research in recent years and doesn't have a whole lot to show for it. Yeah. It's very targeted, even though it's very yeah. big. Now, the problem here is that it doesn't look like they're getting a billion dollars. They're going to have to take it, for, or a lot of it, from the existing NIH budget. Right, they that's are actually concern. Right, well, they, they actually have... Um, the other part of what's going on here is they are uh, euthanizing the National Center for Research Resources, the NCRR, which is which has a lot of people concerned because that um, center has been supporting some some significant stuff. But uh, I, I followed this a little bit, um, obviously, <laughs> and uh, and it seems what they're doing is they're sort of parting out the NCRR to other parts of the NIH, and a big chunk of it is going to go into this new um, Center for Translational Sciences. Yeah, so, so that's the institute that has to be cut to make this one. Right. Is that what you're saying? Then, oh, There's yes. some sort of ceiling on numbers of institutes. Is that the idea? No. Well, there there ought to be, but there I don't think there's a formal one. Um, it's just they need to get the money from somewhere. And also the NCRR, uh, it, depending on who you're talking to, it's it's either been uh, kind of okay or not very useful. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so they're they're trying to shake things up and taking this approach and. And I think it makes some sense. As I said, they're, they're, it's not the government trying to become the pharma industry. It's the government trying to pick up the slack where where private industry clearly can't. Mm. There's a lot of okay. controversy over this. Some people are saying the NIH is not likely to be good at drug discovery, so why are they doing this? But I think it's a good idea. I think there are a lot of drugs that don't get a lot of screens that don't get done for various reasons, and this yeah. could jumpstart it. And it's very hard for companies. Uh, the reason private industry has failed at this in recent years is that it's hard for them to justify taking a risk on some of these new drugs that um, that are quite likely to fail, and that if they do pay off, it's not going to be for another 15 years, whereas the government can step in mm. and have that kind of a long-term investment do the initial studies get the the translational research is the key word for 
this sort of uh, getting it from the bench to maybe an initial phase one clinical trial. And at that point, I think the hope is that private industry would come in and say, oh, hey, wow, you know, now that you've gotten it all the way to phase one, we will go ahead and take that because now we yeah, see that it's a, right, it's a good drug. Right. I, this is an interesting quote at the end from William Potter, who is, um, he just retired as a VP of Translational Neuroscience at Merck. He said, far more basic research is needed to be done on the causes of mental illness before anyone can create breakthrough drugs. We don't even understand how lithium works. How can we find drugs systematically for mental illness? Is that true? I guess. Uh, yeah, I think I that's know. pretty much, that's... Um, my wife's perspective on it as well as a psychiatrist, she's... Because hmm. for viruses, we know all of the targets, it's just a matter right. of screening. Same with bacteria. I think this would be great for antivirals and antimicrobials, but I don't know that that's going to be the main focus. It sounds like neuroscience is going to be a focus. Neuroscience is probably a better target because it's an area that's been harder for companies to get a grasp on. Well, if there's no target then that's not going to be solved by this, right? I was, well, I was, but if, I think the issue is that there's promising basic research yeah. that um, companies are just not willing to invest in because it's still a too early a stage. Yeah. And so the saying, idea of this institute is to move it to a stage where companies would invest in it and then move it into private industry. And private industry does an exceptional job of late-stage clinical trials and, and, of course, selling drugs once they're, yeah, once they're sure. approved. I was thinking about this. How do you, it's, it seems to me developing a drug for mental illness is a real challenge. If you're developing an antimicrobial, you screen for stuff that uh, stops bugs from growing, right? Yeah. How do you screen for something that treats depression? Well, you have to have a target, right? Yeah, yeah. you have to have you have to have a measure. There are there are these um, various tests and scoring systems that try to quantify the unquantifiable. Um, and uh, there's uh, there's a lot of ambiguity to it, yeah. But you don't screen these drugs on people, right? Uh, well, once you determine they're safe in animals, then you do pretty much go into people. It's hard because unless you have an enzyme or something, right? You yeah. have to have symptoms as your endpoint. Yeah, and it's no coincidence that the the antidepressants, for example, that have come out in recent years, like Prozac et al., um, those are things that have specific no neurochemical mechanisms of action. There are serotonin reuptake inhibitors, um, you know, and there are drugs that target the uh, the dopamine response because we know that those are involved in particular things. Um, and as neuroscience moves further forward, there are some other potential leads. But again, it's just they're too early for industry to take big risks on. Well, well it'll be interesting to see how this turns out. Yeah, it's yep. and they want to do it by the end of the year, get it going should be interesting right. and let us know what you think i think it's pretty neat and maybe it's just the beginning and they could have more i thought that it would be interesting to have these all over the country so you could you could tap into science talent all over the u.s and establish these kinds of institutes that would do these sorts of screens but uh, we'll see what happens I, so anyway check out the article it's very thought-provoking as you see and that will do it for this episode of email twiv uh, there are many ways to find us at twiv.tv, where you can download or play and check out the show notes. We're on iTunes at the Zoom Marketplace, and you can listen by streaming using the Microbe World app at microbeworld.org. And, of course, send us your questions to twiv at twiv.tv. We will eventually get to them. We want to read all of them. Don't forget our Facebook page, which is growing by the day. Facebook.com slash This Week in Virology, a little community of virus fans over there. Alan Dove is at alandove.com. Good to see you again. Always a pleasure. And we will see you next week as we will see Rich Condit uh, at bit.ly slash poxdoc. Thanks, Rich. You're quite welcome. Great to be here. I always enjoy this. Good episode. Very nice great. questions, everyone. Yeah, yeah. yeah. great emails. Great emails. Uh, it's, it's really cool how the emails can drive a show like this. They bring up a lot of great stuff. You know, there are many podcasts that are entirely email-driven. 
It's very interesting. Not Makes just sense science, to me. But uh, yeah. they're, you know, how to do this or how to do that, and people mm-hmm. sending questions, and that's the whole show. It's pretty cool. We could actually do almost every episode of TWIV with email, um, mm-hmm. the rate that we get them, but we, we like to mix it up. Yep. Anyway, I'm Vincent Racaniello at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We will be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. Thank you.